Hello, software engineers. My mic is a little hot. Let me turn it down a bit. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone has had a great weekend. This week, we are going to be discussing software architecture. We're going to do a brief introduction. And and what I first want to present to you is the idea that, you know, this semester with your project, you're kind of modeling a Scrum-like system. You have a set of requirements, a backlog. Each sprint, you pick some subset of those requirements to implement. You then iterate on those requirements and produce a potentially shippable product, and you repeat this cycle over and over. And so rather than going from no software to finished software, like you would do in, say, many of your course assignments, rather you are building on a system repeatedly over time and as you complete requirements, you get closer and closer to this final release. And one of the advantages of this, of course, is that if you start building your software and your customer's not happy with it, well, you can change the requirements on the backlog in order to fix it. So this type of design practice, or this type of implementation practice is more receptive to change. But this means we necessarily need to go back and change our software. And, and the question is, how do we go from requirements to workable, working modifiable software? What do I mean by modifiable? If we are constantly adding to the system, we may find that some additions necessitate change. Say hypothetically, and this is very, very hypothetical. Let's say we have uh, two classes, class B and class C which use some third class, class A. This is called a dependency. Because B uses A and C uses A, B depends on A and C depends on A. And what this means is that if class A has to change its interface, that is to say what functions it has available, that will necessitate changes to class B and C. The opposite is not true. If I need to make changes to class B, I don't necessarily need to change anything in class A. There might be some changes I need to make that necessitate it, but it's not necessary. If I make changes to the interface in class A, changes to B and C will very likely be necessary. And let's say that we, we add some third, fourth class, class D. And class D also uses class A, but because of uh, some extra information class D needs, or some extra information it provides, we need to modify the interface of class A, let's say add a third uh, argument to this func1 function. Well now, if B and C use this function, B and C have to be updated to include that extra argument. So necessarily, by just adding class D to A and making one change to A, I potentially now have to change B and C. Like a still pond, if you drop a stone in it, the water ripples outward. And what we want to do when we build our software is we want to avoid a situation where the pond gets bigger and bigger and so the ripples spread farther. And so what we want to do is we want to think about design and the first step of design, which is what this is, going from requirements to being able to implement a system, that is what design is going to do. It's going to think about how we build our system in order to ensure the system can be modified later with hopefully as little change as possible. So we wanna design a flexible system that can be changed to meet new requirements or changing requirements, requirements that aren't initially known because that's the point of Agile, to be able to respond to that. And the first step of this design process is selecting the correct architecture. You don't just start if we're talking about construction, you don't just start building a skyscraper and figure out the architecture as you go. The first thing you have to do is sit down and design the system with the architect. And that's what we're going to talk about. So as software grows, it will be harder to make changes to the existing system. And this is a, a thing called software entropy. As a software system ages, by ages we don't just mean time. By ages we specifically mean as you make changes to the system, as you add classes, change functions, fix bugs, whatever, any changes to the system over time become increasingly risky to propagate, to spread out and cause you to have to change large factors of the system. 
And having to change other parts of the system to accommodate one change is bad. But it sometimes happens. If we select the correct architecture and the correct design, we can limit that. But as our system ages, these events will happen more and more. So where to begin? We've already talked about requirement solicitation. Um, that's our first part. We then want to, and then we talk about modeling those requirements. We then want to do some type of, uh, and this is in, in the case of your project, you've hopefully done this. In your project, you've gotten requirements from their survey. Hopefully you've done some type of technology exploration of here are the things I'm going to need. You know, we've talked about using a Google sign-in. Hopefully you've started exploring that already before you've watched this video. You've made your GitHub readables and you've made your build environments, right? Now what? Well, if this were a small project, one or two person, so not, not your group of four, one or two, what would you do? Well, you would start by designing the system. And we can talk about design at very different levels. First, we can talk about system architecture. System architecture is, is very, very high level design of complex systems. It often talks about the business processes. Here we're talking about like, you know, how the system is gonna be used externally, not just within the software. You know, who, who's gonna inter interact with the system? Who are the stakeholders? How are they gonna interact? What are they gonna do? That's, that's talking about the system as a whole. Um, from there, we can get into the actual high level design. And we're gonna start talking about uh, soon terms like modularity uh, and how that helps build good software design. We'll talk about what data sources to use, how those data sources are gonna be built and interacted with, uh, what internal interfaces are going to exist. That is uh, how different components interact with each other, as well as external interfaces. How is the system gonna be interacted with by the user? Maybe if there's some hardware component, like if you're building an autonomous car, the hardware features need to be incorporated into this design, the cameras, etc. And that's separate from low level design because in low level we're specifically talking about like what algorithm should we use? What data structure should be used? At high level, we're more talking about, if you think about it in terms of classes, how these classes interact and how groups of classes interact, how groups of classes that form a component interact, etc. So now, uh, what are the system architecture or system engineering aspects of your project? Pause for a moment and really think about this. Hopefully you've started actually implementing something. What is the architecture that you have planned? Or do you have one planned? What are the system engineering aspects of your project so so, so, we, so system architecture system engineering we've kind of decided a bit for you right you, you know you're building a django app you, this is going to be used within a web browser right who are the stakeholders pause the video for a second here pause pause the video for a second and really think about what are the system architecture points of your system what are what are what is the who are the stakeholders how are they going to interact with the system think about that okay but now let's talk about the software architecture and hopefully you've paused if you haven't paused now and, and think about that actually really think about it but now let's get to that middle level the software architecture that that middle level and, and I'm going to read this quote. Software architecture encompasses the set of significant decisions about the organization of the software system, including the selection of the structural elements and their interfaces of which systems composed. And, and by interfaces, we don't mean user interface, like a, like a website or an app or a command line. We're talking about the interfaces in terms of how this component is used by other software within the system. Uh, if you remember back in 2110, we, we talked about Java interfaces. This is a bit more broad than that. The, the, the term I would often use here is API. That is, what functions does a class have available? What do those functions do? How are they used? That's what we mean by interfaces in this case. Um, so 
It's the selection of structural elements and their interfaces by which system is composed. It is behavior as specified in collaboration among these elements. That is, how do these systems interact with each other? And it's the composition that is the building of these structural and behavior elements into larger subsystems and an architecture that guides this organization. Now, that, that quote seems really hot and heavy there. More broadly, it's the highest level breakdown of a system into its parts. The decisions that are very hard to change. Because, we, because we're talking about how the system is going to be laid out at core, at the, at, 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 at the root design level, we're talking about the broad organization of the system. It's very hard to change this later. You can't say, oh, we're going to build a skyscraper and then halfway through say, nah, forget the skyscraper. Let's, let's just build it really, really wide instead of really, really tall. You can't do that in construction, right? You start to build the skyscraper, you're stuck with the skyscraper. Now you have to shoehorn decisions into a skyscraper that may not actually fit particularly well there. So when we're talking about architecture, we are talking about what is the overall organization of the system? And we want to get that question right, because if we get that question wrong, it's going to be very, very hard to change it later. This is the first design decision, and it's the most impactful. And so, when talking about high-level design, um, we define a system in terms of its components and interactions. So maybe that's your classes and their API and how different classes depend on each other. I gave kind of a, an example of that here with this hypothetical classes interacting example. And we can think of components within the system as either individual classes or collections of classes. So for instance, you can have an independent program as a component, like maybe your um, you know, using login through Google, through Google login. In order to set that up, that's an independent program. You can't change that, but you have to incorporate that into your system. Different groups of modules in class that perform a task can be an example of a component. A client or a server can be an example of a component. Files, databases, examples of components. And the idea of the architecture is how do we make these things interact? Interactions can be calling a procedure from a class or from an independent program, or it could be communication between the components. One class communicates with the database, or one class communicates with another class, etc. So that's what we mean by architecture. And you can have a high level and a low level architecture in a system. You can say the overall thing is structured as a, as a MVC, but individual components are three tier architecture, whatever. But let's think about it right now. I want you to take a second and think about how you would describe the architecture of your system so far. Pause the video. Now, some of you may have found that question hard to answer. Because after all, you're used to, you know, building quick disposable projects for the purposes of classes, right? The quick disposable software. And so you haven't really had to think about architecture. In fact, in 2110, we, we told you what the architecture was, I know. In, in 1110, you didn't even have to worry about architecture at all. You, you only had a single program. You didn't have multiple classes interacting. So what is the architecture of a system may be a hard question for you to answer because you, you haven't ever thought of it necessarily before. Now, the first question is, do all your projects need to have the same architecture? And I'm shrinking my face there a bit. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm crushing your head. I'm crushing your head. No. Um, there are going to be common elements among projects of even different types, but you will be making different decisions. So we're going to talk a bit about reference architecture here in a second. Um, the reference architecture of how web apps are often made. And this captures the fundamental uh, relationships and subsystems that are going to be existing pretty much in any system, in, in, in any domain that you're building with, with say, a web app. Um, so this is the reference architecture example. Uh, and this is a generic web browser. And different web browsers 
implement this differently. But the idea is the user interface, that's what you're seeing on the screen. That's the top level. That uses the browser engine. But the nice thing is if the user interface changes, we don't actually have to change the browser engine. That's actually a, a pretty advantageous thing. Going back to our example about dependencies, the user interface depends on the browser engine, not the other way around. And since the user interface is likely to change to meet particular needs, it's helpful to think of it as a separate entity. So we have broadly a user interface that works with the browser engine. The browser engine works, uh, it's, it works with the rendering engine that actually produces the display. It uses, you know, all these different tools to produce what the user should see, drops into the display backend, which the user interface references to pull up. Then from there, the user and the browser may both work with some particular shared set of data. And this is a generic web browser architecture, broadly. You can see here that we have Mozilla. And if you're not getting what every single one of these things does yet, don't worry too, too much yet. Uh, so here, for example, is Mozilla. Here's the user interface. Inside of Gecko is both the browser engine and the rendering engine. We have systems that deal with communicating over the network, systems that do JavaScript interpretation, systems that parse XML files or, da or data files, um, etc. Netscape, this one's a lot more complicated, Netscape Navigator, and it's a lot older. And it's why uh, we don't use it as much anymore. Not a lot of systems are, are built with that in mind. But most likely, you probably weren't thinking of an architecture like this. Most likely, your architecture probably looks something like this so far. Although you, may, you probably don't even have this many services yet. And this is called a big ball of mud. And a big ball of mud is what we would call an architectural anti-pattern. We're going to talk about architectural patterns here in a second. The idea of a pattern is it is kind of a good guiding principle or guide or set of guidelines of how to design a system. It is a pattern that has been learned to be effective because it gets used repeatedly. The big ball of mud is an anti-pattern because it doesn't do any of those things. The big ball of mud is this. You add classes as you think of them. Pardon me. You add classes as you think of them. You add services as you need them. And you don't really pre-plan in advance where they are going to go. You just kind of slap them on. Think of it kind of like sticky notes. You just put it on the surface. The problem with the big ball of mud is that it has basically no thought in the future to how the system will evolve over time. And as a result of that, you end up with a lot of interdependencies. You end up with a lot of classes depending on a lot of other classes, and one change will necessarily propagate very far and wide, and it can make the system even even more expensive to maintain later on. This leads to higher entropy, whereas something like this reference architecture, this would be, say, a reference uh, architecture to a generic web browser, by planning out how these systems are going to react broadly, and again, these components are, may not be individual classes. They may be groups of classes, services, whatever. The point is, by planning to organize these things in this way, and by making sure that we have one directional dependencies, we can limit the propagation of changes. Um, you know, so that's why when we talk about Net Netscape Navigator, like, yeah, this is bad. It's full of tons of interdependencies. It's hard to read for that very reason. So an architectural pattern is a strategy for how to solve a common problem. I have these components that I want to combine. It is not a fully coded or implemented system. Rather, it is an idea. It is a pattern that omits the implementation details. It's intentionally vague, but that's because you think of the pattern as the idea that you implement. Um, so there are some examples of patterns 
in architecture. There's also design patterns, how we organize specific components or specific features. And we're going to definitely talk a lot about design patterns. But architectural patterns are just broad uh, organizational structures for the system. An example would be something like a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. The idea of a peer-to-peer -peer architecture is you have multiple computers communicating with each other over some shared network. Often that shared network is the internet as a whole, the World Wide Web. And so you communicate to other systems via input and output. And this allows, um, you know, you can synchronize different applications. You can distribute the load of the system. So if you have a system where you need a lot of individual systems interacting together and you want to distribute the load of some work and you want to have some agreement with how that's distributed, you may use a peer-to-peer -peer architecture where you have some network that computers are communicating with each other over. And you will design the app by designing what features are the computer doing, what is the input and output to the network that the computers are going to perform. A layered architecture is the system is provided or is organized into hierarchical layers. Each layer provides a service to the layer above it, and each layer acts as a client to the layer below. By what I mean, service and client. If you go into a restaurant and order food, you are a client. If you are working in the restaurant, bringing food or cooking food for the client, you are the server. So the idea is there's some supervisor that uses our, I should, uh, pardon me, <clears throat> a su supervisor is a client to global planning and global planning is a, ser is a service for the supervisor. Control, navigation, etc. So low level control is a service used by sensor interpretation. So this might be for say a robotic system. The supervisor in this case, by the way, is not a human. It's just the overarching uh, high level program that, that's managing everything below it, albeit indirectly. So the low level control, this is uh, used by the sensor interpretation and it feeds information back to sensor interpretation. But the key is the supervisor is not aware of control. The supervisor is not aware of navigation. The supervisor is not aware of real world modeling and so on. Same way real world modeling is very aware of the navigation module and the sensor integration module. But it is unaware of the modules outside of its scope. This makes each system easier to design and build because... If, change, if I need to change the interface of real-world modeling, then certainly that's going to affect navigation because navigation is going to have to update to that changed interface. But if navigation can update without changing its own interface, its own set of features, then control would not need to change because we made a change to real-world modeling. We can stop the propagation. Think of it, you know, again, like those ripples in the pond, but we stop them somehow. We prevent them from propagating further. And this idea is at the basis of um, this layered architecture. There's N tier or N layered architecture where N is the number of layers. And a common example of that is a three tier architecture where at the top we have the user interface. And the user interface is a client for the business logic. And the business logic is a client for the data. Data provides information to the business logic. The business logic provides some subset of that information or some modification of that information to the user interface. So the user interacts with something, a web browser, a form, command line, whatever. This allows us to design an app that has a certain look and feel, but could change. They just changed the layout of Facebook. I hate it, but they can do that because they do some type of design like this. The user interacts with that something 
And that something follows a particular set of rules to form an action. That is to say that it interacts with the business logic layer. And the business logic layer follows those rules or standard operating procedures or whatever you want to call them. Follows some process to gather information. Where does that get the information from? The business logic layer interacts with the data layer. So if I were to illustrate this, I might do something. And, and we're, we're working live with shapes in Google present. So broadly, and again, this gets into a layered architecture. We have the user interface layer, sometimes called the presentation layer. We have the business logic layer, and then we have the data layer. And sometimes, by the way, you'll, you'll see this also called the controller layer or just, or just logic layer. You'll see it called different things, but the idea is the same. And the idea is the interface uses the business logic layer and the business logic layer uses the data layer. But the user interface does not directly use the data layer. It never directly interacts with data. And the advantage of this is that the data layer may be something that changes. Maybe instead of using files, you switch to a live database. Well, now you definitely have to make changes to the data layer. And you're, you know, you're going to have to replace all that file I.O. with SQL queries, right? But... If you can preserve the same interface, that is, you change everything. Like It's like, imagine you have a house, right? And someone remodels the entire inside of the house, but they keep the outside looking exactly the same. You know, then that's what I'm talking about. If data layer can change its implementation details, go from file IO to say a live database without changing its interface, then the business logic layer is completely unaware of the change and the change never even propagates there. If the change does necessitate a change to the interface, data layer's interface has to change. Maybe we need a username and password and address for the database. Okay, so the business logic layer will need to be updated. But again, if the business logic layer can be updated without changing its interface, then we don't need to ever update the user interface in this case. So everything uses the thing below it, but the advantage is in a, in a layered architecture, the data layer doesn't even need to necessarily be aware the controller layer exists. A change to the user interface will not necessarily result and, and almost never will result in necessarily changing anything in the next layer down. Changes tend to, you can have a change that propagates up, but it's much less likely to propagate down. Why, why are we spending all this time talking about this? Because the, the, we want to have desirable attributes in our system. Because remember, we want to make our software modifiable. We want to have as few ripples in our pond as possible every time we make a change. So in order to do this, we need to have good modularity, which we will talk about. We'll, we'll talk about it, I promise you. Um... We want to be dry, so you want to be dry as opposed to wet, wet, write everything twice, write everything thrice, etc. You want to write something one time. We want to separate our concerns. The idea is each component should deal with one concern or one subset of concerns. It shouldn't deal with everything. You want to hide design decisions. By that I mean, you may be thinking, wait, we just spent a lot of time modeling design decisions. We're not talking about hiding it from the developers. We're saying that one class should be as aware of the rest of the system as little as possible. In order to design our system well, we want as few dependencies as we can have. We will necessarily have dependencies. The user interface will necessarily have at least some dependency on the data. If not direct, then at least indirect. So we're going to have dependencies. Can we limit those? And by limiting them, can we, can we make it such that one system being changed propagates as little as possible? So we're going to look at these examples later in a design lecture. But I just want you to know that the idea of peer-to-peer -peer architecture, of layered architecture, of MVC, 
which we're gonna, which I'm not talking about in this le lecture, Model View Controller. That's going to be next week. That Model View Controller is another architectural pattern. That is, uh, and I that is a pattern that was formed because it's useful for achieving these things: good modularity, ensuring things can be dry as opposed to wet, separation of concerns, etc. So going back to our three-tiered architecture, user interface, business logic, and data. This allows for the user interface to be changed without changing any other system. That's, that's huge because the user interface may change a lot. It allows for reuse of components. If I want to access a database, I only need to uh, and get... All the get a student with a given ID number. Let's that's a common business thing. I mean, get a student with a given ID number. I only need to write that feature once in the data layer and the controller layer. If it has multiple features that need, or the business logic layer, excuse me, if it has multiple features that needs to perform that action, it can call that same action, not re implement it. It allows teams to work independent on each component. The user interface team can be separate from the business logic team, can be separate from the data team, and it's extendable. That is to say, it's easily changeable. We can add more layers if we need to. Why three layers? Why not four if we feel that we have valid design reasons to do so? Uh, but it's also just easily modifiable over time. Uh, so we will talk a lot about MVC, which I didn't mention, is another architectural pattern. We're going to talk about that a lot next week. But the next video I'm going to put out, and I will put this out uh, very, very shortly, is going to be looking at an example of three-tier architecture in Java, an actual implementation of it. Uh, it's going to be a very rough, simple implementation, but it's just designed to show you the advantages, to show you what we mean very practically at a code level when we talk about things like reuse when we talk about allowing for change etc so i hope you watch that video when it comes out i hope you enjoyed this one and thank you for watching take care